Welcome to the Not In Business School Business Leaders Podcast, where business leaders tell their stories and share their insights. All our guests have a personal connection with Not In Business School, so listen, learn, enjoy, and share. Sam Baines is an accomplished chef whose restaurant has two Michelin stars and serves some of the finest dishes in the country. Sat was born and brought up in Derby uh, in the early 1970s. His mum and dad ran news agents and off licences, but as a teenage catering student, he fell in love with food. In 1999, he won the prestigious Roo Scholarship, and in 2002, he launched rest- restaurant Sat Bains with Rooms in Nottingham. The following year, he was awarded Michelin star, increased to two stars in 2011. For the last two decades, he has been one of the country's great leaders and innovators in fine dining. Sap Baines, welcome to the Nottingham Business School Business Leaders Podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. So, as I said there, you started as a, a teenage kid and student at Derby College. What do you know now that you wish you'd known then? <laughs> I've always liked life to be a journey. I've never liked to be told too many things in advance. So I've got a, you know, me and my wife Amanda, we've been together a long time, 30 odd years, and we've met in Derby. So we've always gone down a path that's less trodden. And I've always liked that because it means you've got to make your own way. Good. Because there's a real part of me that doesn't like laziness. And laziness probably breeds, um, it just probably breeds being too relaxed, being too stagnant. Whereas I've always tried to believe that if you choose a path that's probably less uh, walked on in terms of in business or your craft or whatever, you have to try harder. And with hardships comes the success taste greater, uh, greater. Do you find that that's a common trait among leaders? I don't know. I, I can only talk about chefs that I know, and but I'm I'm very different to them because I'm predominantly self-taught. Where I obviously went to college for two years and did my city and guilds, but I never had a mentor where I've worked under a great chef. Where a lot of my friends in the the echelons of the the, the top tier of, of cooking in the UK and overseas and then the globe. They've all had, oh, I worked for this guy for three years, I worked for that Michelin star chef for that. So they've all had this kind of like mentorship where they've had someone tell them. I've had no one do that, so I've had to work it out. So since winning the new scholarship, even though I was a novice going into that in terms of never had any pedigree of um, physically working in a prestigious kitchen, I just had to read a lot. It, it makes you get up and get off your backside and, and graft and it makes you understand things. I think when you learn things for the first time, it's a greater impact than being told something. Does that give you a particular satisfaction than your success? Not necessarily, because I don't see the success. I just see that today's another day. It's Friday. We've got a very busy night today. We've got a new dish going on. I've got 30-odd staff that are really excited about the new dish and about tonight. So go on, what's the new dish? It's a langoustine from Scotland. So they're beautiful langoustines that's been seared for just five seconds, so it's still rare. And the sweetness of it is incredible. In terms of the beautiful sweet corn sauce, and it's got little popcorn kernels on it that dusted in seaweed. So we tried it all this week and we signed it off yesterday. So it's going live tonight with the, with the restaurant. And that's a big fish. It is for me because that's where I find my little satisfaction. That's where I find my little challenges and little wins. It's not about, it's never been about accolades. It's never been about how much money there's in the bank or anything like that. Success for me is very different to probably a lot of people. Success is about having a business that's relevant, having a, a, a team that's passionate, having some someone believe in the vision uh, of what you believe in. Okay, so when you start very early on, you realised what you wanted to do. I think I read I read something said you know, when you're in your early twenties, you thought Michelin star, I really fancy that, but you didn't actually take off until much later in your twenties after the reward. Do you have to be patient as a leader? Do you maintain a focus on what you really want? I've I've never believed that I was going to be a leader, and I, I, I'm naturally. Over the, the years, I can I can look back and reflect and say, you know what, I have led from example. I'm I'm a firm but fair leader. I try to be very pragmatic, tell people exactly what is going wrong, why, and you know, a good bollocking doesn't go astray. And and you know, we're in kitchens, and, and obviously it's not the way it used to be, but the kitchens are tough places, and the places where disciplines uh, it needs to be adhered to, and there's the customer's expectation is massive, and so I've never really thought of myself as a a leader, but obviously as time goes on and you start seeing all of your old boys and girls front of the house, back of the house doing so well, and it's, you've got to remember, it's not just me, it's me, it's the restaurant, you know, we've created this 
me and my wife Amanda have created this kind of like school of excellence that we never stop. We never stop evolving. I've like been working on new chairs. We've got a designer in and we're physically hand making these chairs to spec for the guests um, comfort where we can just go out and just buy some because we want it to have that signature of RSP. We want it to be our unique chair. Sure. You, you took on a, touched on a couple of things in there. You touched on about the kitchens. Uh, communication is such an important part of, of leadership. You know, we sit and watch you. You go and run these on the television. You see, it's not like that now. But these are split second decisions that you have to, that you, you know, messages that you have to get across there in a the kitchen very quickly. How do you do that? So the kitchen is normally very quiet. And when you think about it, there's got to be one person shouting the orders out and the timings for the dishes. And that kind of dictates the path and the, and the, the routine of the service. If it's too noisy, you call each other and, it, and there's lots of mistakes can happen. There's a definite element of discipline. So everyone's ready by their station. They've all got a task. They've all got a certain time that the dish is going to be ready. And they've got a certain time in the menu when they're going to have to perform. So there's an element of you are a task driven, time driven, and it's got to be of a certain standard. So when you add all that into the mix, it's a very volatile recipe for the pushing yourselves as an individual to, to, to hit them really high levels of professionalism because one dish going wrong has a massive effect, has a chain effect, because we only do tasting menus. So that could have a sequential uh, effect on the rest of the meal. So we've got to make sure the guests are waiting too late. We want to make sure that this is rectified before he goes out to the restaurant. And 99% of the time, the guests never hear or see anything that goes on in the kitchen, which is how it should be, because it's about escapism. It's about your worries and left at the door for three, four hours so you can escape. And enjoy an evening with your loved ones or your friends or your partners or, or an anniversary, whatever it is. But we do have a chef's table, we do have a kitchen bench. And that means as guests have access to the kitchen and sit there in the middle of the kitchen to see what's going on. So there's a level of professionalism. I want my chefs and, and all my staff and the team to look good, to look professional, have clean fingernails, clean aprons, because they're representing an industry that has for many years been looked down upon. So over the last 10 to 15, 20 years even, it started to look at a real professional place to work and have life skills and also how to have a career and that's going to last 30 years. So wait a minute, was that part of your aim to start with? I mean, create a new business, be very successful, you know, cook great food, serve some great, great dishes. But were you, were you conscious that you were actually taking the whole industry with you or you were trying to? No, not at all. Because because I've been here 24 years now, so I've been a chef 20, 36 years. So when we took this on, it was a case of, okay, we've got a limited budget, we've got this, we've got that. My business partner was my accountant, had us all sharing it. And I was learning the business from him, you know, I was, I was, I was gleaning. I was in the office, you know, you know gross profits. And, and if I put two pence on there, would that generate four grand a year? And I was fascinated. So figures have fascinated me. So, so it's almost like the business side of things. Like, you know, when you start looking at, you look at rates and you look at your, your cost to your income to your out spend the journey and you've got to then juggle everything you've got to say okay now i'll pay tax in three months i will have a big chunk there i got that and it becomes like it can become overwhelming because when i i guys bought a business one round you know i got rid of him because he was he was an accountant and he was lazy because obviously the work we were doing me and my life outweighed the work he was doing he was on the same amount of money so i did want that so i wanted my own um restaurant where we were 100 percent shareholders which we are and what's also going we've got no backers so with having no backers, we haven't got to ask permission. So what you can do is anything you want within um, business-minded sense. So you've got to say, okay, we're going to close an extra day, so I'm not opening the Tuesday anymore. First thing we did is we would go to the accountant and say, our, our accountant that we pay no longer, the business partner, okay, we're looking at closing Tuesdays. How would that affect turnover for the year? So he gave us two years' projections. So then we saw we could make it viable, so we did. And that way, in 2015, we closed Tuesdays, made it a four-day week, which was one of the first in the industry, gave staff three days off consecutive, gave them a, a standard of life with a salary that was competitive to, to, to all over the UK, gave them health insurance, gave them uh, access to uh, things like counselling, um, dentists, chiropathy. So all of a sudden, they had this kind of real professional look at our industry. If you and, and one of the drivers in fairness in the kind of lifestyle stuff is my wife Amanda. So she's very much that ilk, front of house, looking at the guest perception is, looking after the staff, and I will do the same in the kitchen. But we ultimately come together to say, okay, we've got to, we'll drive to Scotland, for example, 
the five hour trip from that five hour trip probably is 10 new d notes that we can impart into the business over the next six months yeah. getting back to the front end of that question are you conscious that you're dragging everybody else up with you i wouldn't say a dragon i think everyone's well, so you're talking about the fact that 20 years ago the industry wasn't as it is now and i think it was a dropout industry because chefing back in the day i'm going back to you know the 80s and 90s when i was a chef is it was you didn't have to be very academic it was something that was manual labor so in that that's how it was always seen, you know, if you drop if you're a bit of a dropout, you were a chef and you know, chefing back then when I was young, you know, thirty years ago, you the, the your split shift, you start at say eight in the morning, you finish at three, you go to the pub, have five pints and ten cigarettes and go back to work at six and it's like where you know, looking now, it's like the guys finish, go to the gym, they could you know, have a have a bloody smoothie and then come back ready for service, geared up with their with their kind of like their protein shakes and they're, they're ready to go. And it's a very different world, but I prefer this world. It's well known in your own world that you're always striving to be amazing. Do you think more successful leaders are driven, driven to achieve? Drive comes in many forms. One is, you know, I look at things like um, the drive to succeed, the drive not to fail, the drive not to fail, the drive to the will, also the will. To, to survive and, and to keep pushing and the relevance of a business, how do you stay relevant after 20 odd years? So I think if you give up and you think this is my lot, I smell it. You can smell it in a business. You know when something's not right because you can just tell it's tiny little things like furniture's looking old or in a restaurant or that dish is a bit old. I've seen that before. There's no real creativity going on. So that's my kind of alarm bells for me. It's like, you know, are we still evolving? Are we still pushing forward? Are we still keeping ourselves excited or the guests excited to come are they looking forward to a new dish or how do you maintain that drive it's something in your stomach i can't just it's innate it's innate and i can't describe it but it's the will it's the will to survive it's the will not to give up it's the will you know people say motivation's great but discipline's greater than motivation because motivation's fickle motivation is i'm going to go to the gym tomorrow tomorrow comes about a late night i won't go to the gym today Discipline makes you go to the gym, not motivation. A discipline is, I'm going to get up at six, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to come to work, I'm going to work on that new dish, I'm going to make sure all the chefs are all clean, I'm going to make sure front of the house have been prepped, we've got the new sommelier, the wine's going to be ready. That's discipline. So that's what restaurants are about. Discipline. Not, not, motivation's fickle. You need it in its small little parts, but discipline is what gets you through. Okay, so, and that can be taught because one of the questions... I'm always asked, we always ask, is our leaders born or are they made? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think you're born as a leader, personally, I don't know that. We you talk about something inside you innate? I think you, you have to find your trigger. You know, my trigger was I got kicked out of the house at 18 because I was going out with Amanda, who was a white girl, and I'm from an Asian background. So I dossed around for a few years until, until to the point where I looked at, we looked at each other and we had nowhere to go. I was out of work. She was working. I hadn't done the new scholarship yet, but okay, we're on our own, we're living in a rented apartment. How are we going to get ahead? And I always remember driving, I'd always remember this car I bought for a thousand pounds. I was driving back from a derby and it was like a red Orion, Ford Orion, well, I remember. And it wasn't great, but we, we had a car, so it was mobile. And I was coming back from my mum's to, to Nottingham. I remember on the inside lane of the A52 from, the, from Derby to Nottingham, there was this BMW. This kind of like dark, sleek BMW overtaken. You know, not fast, just really casual. It was all slow motion. And there was a woman in there. She looked really nice. And the guy looked really cool. And I just said to Amanda, when's that going to be his? And she said, when we're in our 30s. Like, just like that. So she believed in that vision because she knows we're both kind of like the same. So we knew hard work will get us to our aspirations. So we've never let anything be done by luck. Does that make sense? It does. And, and it's, it's that maintaining that focus. That I, you know, it doesn't leave you. It's a strange thing to every single day do the same thing. Or better. Now this is 2023. You've got your first Michelin star in 2003. Yep. Two decades. Yep. But never ever look back, never never thought, never walk into the restaurant and think, oh, you know what? I think we're there. 
we were thinking, okay, what can we do? What can we make it improve? What's the customer's expectation? How can we make the guest expectation better? How can we be better? How can we drive the team to be aspirational? Okay, so you're driving your team. But over that 20-year period, your style must have changed. I think you mature, obviously, in business and, and, and uh, as a person. You, you, you read a lot more, you learn a lot more, and you take on advice or stuff you've taken on uh, through reading or whatever it is or business lessons you've learned. And I, I like utilising information. For example, if someone says to me, oh, Sat, if I'm going to see a podcast like this is, and I've learned something, I'll have to implement it. If I, if I believe in it, because it will hit a note. Because we've all got characters and we've all got parts of our characters that we don't know yet, haven't formed. But something could trigger that. And then you say, you know what, I'm going to go down this little rabbit hole and, and discover something and discover about taste or the fifth taste or in, implement things into the menu, like the peak and flow of, how to create a play in theatre. And that's how I've devised a tasting menu. So you start off with an introduction. So our introduction is the five characters, which is your five tastes. Then it shows you a crescendo, which is like your main course. And it goes into a crossover, which is a conflict. And then it finishes on a crescendo, which is your last dish, which is your conclusion, which is a finish. So we've applied different methods because you are open to creativity and you've not had a set pattern how to do a menu. I look at other genres like music. Okay, if I want to see in a musical for three hours, what keeps my attention? Drama. You know, the lighting, the sound. That's what keeps my attention. If you do it here, you're sitting here for three hours. How do you not get bored? By giving you conflict with a dish that's kind of really sharp, followed by something that's really smooth and warm, followed by something that's kind of got this beautiful piece of meat and you can smell the barbecue on it, and you salivate and you get giddy. So it's the same. It's a visual it's a multi-sensory experience. Sure. So within all that, what's the best decision you've, you've made in the last 20 years? I think it was to sack my accountant. No, it was my partner. <laughs> but is that, uh, is, is that, you know, most leaders say they try and surround themselves with people who are very, very good at what they do, or even better than them. I, unfortunately, we attract people that I want to cling on to your success by sharing that, by be, becoming almost hollow Okay. hollow in their field and you have to identify mm. you've got to identify very quick because otherwise you could lose your business okay so if that's your best decision what was the one where you think oh no I could have done that one better I, I don't know there's, there's, there's always going to be things that you could wish you'd done better but obviously with the way the, the situation of the economy is at the moment obviously we just had the budget with the crisis of um, you know heat and how uh, people's welfare it was a difficult time for restaurants you know it's a difficult time for all all businesses not just mine not just here. So you've got to be relevant. So what we did is we did a, a lunch uh, on a Saturday where it's a bit less than a dinner and it's proved massively successful. So we're shocked because we can only try. So I've always said to someone, this is one thing I've, I will take and I will say to the guys, don't tell me, show me. That means, oh, I've got an idea. Uh, and they tell me, like verbally. I'm not interested in verbal because I'll make my own version of it in my head. Show me what you mean. That means if I've got a new, if someone's got a new dish, chef, I've got a new idea for this cod. No, 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 no. Order the cod. Get what you need. It's t today's Wednesday, Friday. Present it to me. So then his his vision comes across, not his words, because words are interpretable. And also, you know, we we I'm I'm uh, working on a new book. It's not out until next year, so it's a it's a bit top secret. So I don't mind saying it, but I'm not saying it more. So we've given the the front of house that are not chefs. We give them two recipes every week. I said, I want you to make this, but I want you to tell me if there was any flaws in it, was there too much of this? Write some notes. They bring it back and they say, it was amazing, too much coriander in that for me. I tweak it. We give them, Amanda gives them £10 towards the ingredients that they've just spent. Because we're proactive. Because you want people to be involved in how you think. So I want, so when you say to me earlier, like, oh, what's your chef's learned? See, all the chefs in the front of the house and everyone that's been here, I've never taught them how to be the best chef or best sommelier or best manager. We've taught them how to think. And we always think out of the box. So we don't take, just because someone's done it, that's right. That I never believe in that. I never have believed in that. I think, what is your version of that, uh, of that idea? And that means you are creating people that are thinking rather than following. Okay. Because there's nothing worse than following someone for your whole career. Because you lose your identity. But what if you had a eureka moment but you were stifled? So that's one of my pet phobias is 
never being able to express myself truly. And because I've found my medium, which is food, my first passion was art, all I've done is change the the crayon or the pencil or the paintbrush into food. So I'm still expressive. And because I'm expressive, I don't look at this as work. It's an enjoyment. And as soon as you are expressive, so if you look, if you teach your guys that they can be expressive too, they're no longer looking as a chore. Oh, I've got to go into work and do that guy's dish. So, so, so all you're actually doing when you when you're teaching them, when you're training them, is just getting them to be themselves. You're you're mentoring them to be to say it's okay to be individual and be yourself. I don't want a robot. I want you, as an individual, to love what you do so it becomes yours. Okay, get that. You must have identified when you take them on and you give them the first job and you when you set them down here, you must have identified something within them that you think, just a minute, I can do something with this person. Not really, no, because not all of them make it. Okay. So there's a there's a fraction, you know, that, that make it and the fraction that don't. But the way I look at it is if oh they're nice. Are oh, they nice guys? Do you get on with them? Is he a good good in good good instinct? Is it good? Your first interaction with them, was he a good eye contact, good handshake? And then have they got the ability so we will always give someone in the kitchen especially a task to cook as a dish after two hours of being here they do a time that kind of like a trial we'll call it they spend time doing some prep with us and we say okay go in the fridge at two o'clock so it's like 10 o'clock now 11 o'clock at two o'clock i'd like to pick anything you want and i'd like to do me either a start or a main or a main or dessert and you've got two and a half hours and i said i always say don't try to think of a dish that you think I would like, think of a dish you love. And what happens is you find there's a very weird kind of sense of, of, of thing happens where some people will go, oh, they are better to a restaurant dish. And so will do a beautiful roast chicken that they'll have at the weekend. And nine times out of 10, it's the one that does the beautiful roast chicken that succeeds in that dish part of their challenge because they're cooking with love. And I think love is an ingredient. So yesterday there was a, a young lad, he's, he's struggling a little bit on the fish section. So he cooks scallops and he cooks the mulled fish. But that's, I've seen it a hundred times. I know he's going through the mill. So I had a word with him yesterday. I goes, what you've got to do is you, you've got to look at this food in this restaurant as if it's yours and you haven't been told to cook it that way. You've got to learn to cook it that way because that's the best characteristics to get that flavour of that scallop. Caramelise it one side, leave it rare on the other side. It's still sweet. It hasn't overcooked, blah, blah. But you've got to almost be jealous of the guest eating your scallop. So you're trying to create a mindset that's no longer task-driven, old-school restaurant style. Give me that scallop, hurry, we've got three minutes. I'd rather them say, chef, the scallop is going to be another minute because it's just needs finishing off. I've won. When I get that, I've won. So there's a lot of psychology in this. There's loads of psychology in it. It's pure psychology because you can always get chefs that can mimic um, dishes or or replicate, but for little examples. So, I believe in rep repetition in anything. The repetition in sweeping the floor, painting the tree, whatever it is, it makes you better. So, we used to make sauce, say once a week, maximum twice a week, and two batches would last four days. I've changed that last year to make it every day. So say you made it once a week. We're in open 47 weeks. You're only making sauce 47 times. Now you do it four times a week. It's nearly 200. Your skill's going to be better. So I've increased your skill set times four. Right. So your craft is better. Your skill's better. Your eye for detail. Your palette. Well, I'm going to ask you the obvious questions. Does not increase uh, the amount of time you spend on doing it? The cost? I don't care about the cost. We run a business. We've got to make sure we make profit. Um, we're not... Me and Amanda got no kids. We've got a house. We've got a car each. What else do we want? We haven't got that legacy of putting kids through school. So we're quite different in that respect. But is that the reason for your success? Because the food, the experience, the hospitality is everything. I think we also like our time away. So, you know, I like to... So old school mentality, I like to do a day's work. So we're open four days. I like to be here. I like to do four days work, but I'm closed for three days so I can go. But when I go, I'm really private. You know, I'll shut the door. If someone, someone saw me last week in Sainsbury's, I've known for 20, 20 years on the gym. I saw you in Sainsbury's. You had your hat on. Were you undercover? I was, every time you see me at the gym, do I wear a hat? She says, yeah. So how's that undercover? I'm the same guy. So she thought, because I've been going to Sainsbury's for 20 years. 
But that, that, that was, I've got the last couple of questions here, but that was one of them. Work-life balance, 24 hours a day, being a chef, very intense. How skinny are you? Very easy. Switch up. It's all about discipline. It's all about being at the right place, the right time, and, and giving your all at the time it's needed. You know, people go, and it's a perception. Shepping is stressful. Yes, it was. It was, but now I'm in that kind of zone where you're orchestrating. You've got a team that are phenomenal. And, that, and also, there's a bit of pressure off, because John, my head chef, for me 21 years, and he's, he was a young lad from Langhall. So he started, he's from Carlton, and he's from, uh, from, from Nottingham. Very talented, one of the most talented chefs I've ever had, but he's worked his way through the ranks. He's been with me 21 years. To see him grow, he's just had his first uh, kid, daughter, Esther. She's four months old yeah. with Hannah. Blows my mind, the cutest of life. But he's, he's part of the team. So when you see chefs coming in, so what happens is the shift. Because we've now got a legacy of chefs that have gone up to do amazing things, the pressures of us teaching these guys, say, what are you going to show me? We're saying, oh, are you going to the next Gareth, the next Niall? And so they have to perform now. So we say to them, show us what you got, then we will show you what you can do. Two last things. Yeah. You, you're very popular, funner, among your peers. <laughs> it's the restaurant of choice for chefs, for people who know they're talking about, experts, critics. How do you keep your feet on the ground? It's very easy. I'm from Derby. My parents are immigrants. They came over in the 60s from India. I know how hard they worked. I know how hard I've worked. And I know that working hard isn't, isn't um, an ailment. I think it's really good for your soul and good for your spirit. And I think without hard work, you know, yes, you can believe your own hype and think, yes, I've got this accolade, that accolade, but this industry is very fickle. You can lose everything overnight. And then what are you going to do? Just so you remember, how do you, how do you, how do you keep, keep that at the front of your mind? It's, it's in, it's in a, it doesn't leave you. Um, it's not being scared of failure. That's not something I'm afraid of. But it's just, it's so easy to fall into a trap of, you know, I'm 52 years old. I've, I've very had a very, very lucky life in terms of I've travelled, I've eaten all over the world, some of the best restaurants in the world, some of them are my friends. We've eaten, we've drunk some amazing wine, we've, we've, we've done some nice things. But all said and done, it's about being content, being happy and being respectful. But if you can be that person and still treat your team and people you meet, your surprise and everyone in the screen or whoever it is, it's about being very honest and genuine. And genuinity is, is one of my biggest passions, you know, and a genuine thing. Okay, so final thing. So this is a podcast for the Not Your Business. <laughs> this, that is jam-packed with the leaders of the future. Brilliant. Um, what advice would you give them starting out now? Have a vision. I was given some advice from um, Maddie Bellamy, who used to own Punchinello's a long time ago. I used to work there. Punchinello's in Nottingham. Good God, yeah. I actually got sacked. I'm not sacked. Any of you bet shit? No, it was just, I wasn't good enough. And I, I knew that. I was going to say, Madden said to me, he goes, um, it just, out of the bloom, we, we just sort of chatting one day and he goes, Sat, what you should do is you should have a 10 year plan and a five year plan and just write it down. Where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in 10 years? I never physically wrote it down, but I did at that time. I was 21, 22. I started reading the K2 and I thought reading about Marco and reading about Nico and all these top chefs in London. I thought, but now this shepping thing isn't just about these restaurants in Nottingham. There's a bigger picture out there. There's like the Michelin Guide, there's the Ruse, and this, that, the other, and Braman Brawl. So I kind of thought, wow, I want to be great one day to work for someone like that, or, or just kind of have this fantasy of. So the five year plan was to ultimately write mentally something down. Where do you want to be? So, would you want to still be renting? Do you want to still have your own house? Or do you want, do you want a car? A little, little kind of like a tip to get to that point. 10 year plan, I was older in 30s. Don't want my own business by then, don't want. But then you've got to work it back because how I want to get there. So, one thing's rele very prevalent in restaurants is where if you want to be a really good chef, you work for the best. So, it's very similar to the students. Once they find their desired track, go to the best, but still trying to keep some of your individuality because it's your individuality that will take you over the hurdles later in life because you might not have been taught that. There's a thing called character. You've got to build that, make it bulletproof, make it Teflon, and believe in your conviction once you start gathering information. Because your your idea could be the thing that changed the world. Why well, choose the world? 
wraps up in. Um, thanks very much for sharing your leadership lessons with us on the Not Your Business School Business Leaders Podcast. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks very, very much. If you enjoyed this episode, then why not check out some of the others that are also available, including those with Prison Governor Professor Lynn Saunders, the radio programmer Dick Stone and the banker Dr Heather Melville. The Nottingham Business School Business Leaders Podcast is produced for Nottingham Trent University by Celtic Tiger Productions. Your presenter was Mike Sassy and your producer was John Collins. <laughs>